Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our Friday night webinar. We are joined tonight by the marvellous Sophie Pavel. So we're really, really excited and thrilled that she's agreed to do this talk for us. Lastly, I will say this is not only Rivers Week, um, it is also Great Big Green Week. Loads of events going on, um, encouraging people to get out in the community, um, to take action for nature. Uh, so I'll be posting a link in the chat um, to find out more about how you can get involved because the week isn't quite over. We've got the whole weekend ahead of us. So time to take a bit of action for nature. Right, I'm going to stop wittering on and pass on to Glenn. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Sophie. Can you just uh, let me know you can hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, yes, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our last talk of um, Rivers Week. It's been a sort of action packed week. Um, very much thanks to Sophie who's helped to put it all together. Uh, we've had walks, talks um, and events and um, our last event will be tomorrow. I'll be working outside of Surrey, just in my hometown um, on the source of the Riverway in Alton, where we'll be doing some gravel recharge, which is uh, restoring the riverbed up on the section of Chalk Stream there. So it's not too late to, uh, to get involved if you would like to come along to that. Um, but yeah, really, uh, Rivers Week is all about us celebrating uh, our rivers, but also creating awareness around them, uh, around some of the pressures that they face, but also, you know, celebrating them as well. Um, never before, um, really, have we seen, you know, such intense pressure, um, certainly from climate change, which uh, we're starting to see very much some of our headwater streams now suffering in the drier months um, as these long dry spells seem to persist. Um, obviously with this, we've got, um, we've got species such as our brown trout, which live up in these headwaters. And they've been there for you know, thousands of years, very genetically diverse populations, uh, very precious to Surrey. Um, but more and more we're seeing these come under pressure um, as climate change begins to bite. So rivers really are on the front line at the moment. And a lot of what we do at the Wildlife Trust is pretending to be a beaver. So I've spent the last eight years um, pretty much putting logs and woody debris into rivers to try and re-naturalise them, um, very similar to what um, a beaver will do, which Sophie will be talking about, um, just to try and encourage some habitat diversity in there, um, create opportunities for a range of different species and kickstart natural processes in our rivers, of which uh, are so lacking in many areas when our rivers have been modified, straightened, deepened, dredged or disconnected from their floodplains. And of course, as climate change does begin to bite, we're seeing these uh, ever increasing in frequency storms, which um, are, are bringing all the floodwaters down and our catchments can't deal with them. And of course, uh, we suffer there um, with flooding of our towns. So really this sort of holistic approach to um, river management, thinking about what's going on in the headwaters and where can we keep water back is not only good for us, it's also good for wildlife. So on that note, um, I think I'm going to head over to Sophie now and um, welcome her. And yeah, Sophie, I'll leave that to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, gosh, well, good evening, everybody. And thank you very much for choosing to spend your Friday evening with me. I'm sure there's a million other things that you could be doing. So if you are here, thank you. Um, and happy Rivers Week. Happy Great Big Green Week. It's been a brilliant kind of whirlwind of a week. And Sophie has done an incredible job along with the team at Surrey Wildlife Trust to put on incredible things to get you excited about rivers and wildlife. So um, make sure you check those out. I think there's other talks and things on their YouTube channel. Um, so there's lots to keep you busy, maybe even as busy as a beaver. We'll find out. Um, so I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about my favourite animal. Um, I am biased, but also I'm going to try and present to you maybe a um, balanced picture of why everyone is so bothered about beavers at the moment. Uh, the way it's going to work, I'm going to talk to you for roughly around the 35 to 40 minute mark. I haven't tested it out yet, so we'll just see how it goes. And then there's going to be lots of opportunity for questions at the end. And as always with beavers, there's always lots and lots of questions. So I'm very pleased to be able to have the time to hopefully answer as many as I can. 
So uh, let's get going. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, so a little bit about uh, who I am. Uh, my name is Sophie Pavel. I'm a science communicator. Um, and I've been lucky enough to work alongside and with and have the wonderful Wildlife Trust as part of my working life ever since I left uni, really. Um, I'm very lucky to be an ambassador for the Wildlife Trust um, and have just been so impressed by all the work that they've been doing over the last few years in terms of tackling these huge big questions like, uh, you know, climate change and British biodiversity loss and things like that. So it's such a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm also communications coordinator for Beaver Trust, uh, which is a new-ish restoration charity, it's about two years old, and that is directly um, helping to physically return beavers to British rivers and help restore wildlife and increase climate resilience and things like that. Um, and last year I was lucky enough to be involved in uh, a documentary with Beaver Trust called Beavers Without Borders, produced by the fantastic Nina Constable Media, and that basically was an introduction to the whole story of beavers in Britain and looking ahead to imagining a future with them living alongside us once again um, and we're lucky that that documentary has won a few awards and things like that so if you are interested maybe afterwards maybe have a, a cheeky little look at that one um, that's called Beavers Without Borders and um, my background I did zoology at the University of Bristol a few years ago and then went on to do a master's in science communication realize I quite like talking, writing, telling more people about nature, realize it's quite important for there to be sort of people to be the middle men between science and the public. Um, as often scientists are absolutely incredible at doing their research, but often when it comes to telling the public about it and putting it in a way that the public can understand, um, that can be quite challenging for them. So uh, science communication was definitely my route into to doing what I'm doing now. Um, and I did that at UWE, which was really, really cool. Um, and yeah, since then I've been doing a bit of freelance work, quite a lot of writing. Um, next year my first book is coming out with Bloomsbury, um, which is about endangered species and climate change. So that has been keeping me very busy over the last year. But here we go, let's talk about beavers. So hopefully you can see this. Um, I don't know how much of my screen I'm sharing. Let's put, I'm just gonna put little zoom icons down there. I'm gonna give you a bit of a Eurasian beaver 101, as I've called it. I'm not gonna assume that you know everything and I'm not gonna assume that you know nothing. Um, we're gonna hopefully hit a bit of a middle ground here. So we're gonna be talking about the Eurasian beaver, which is the European beaver, the beaver that is in British rivers at the moment, hopefully gonna be a bit more of them too. I just wanna give a shout out to two of my friends who I work with at Beaver Trust called Josh and Elliot, getting good, getting good quality high resolution photographs of wild beavers in their natural habitat is really difficult and very challenging. Um, and yet Josh and Elliot uh, have managed to cap capture some of what I believe to be, you know, the most stunning portraits of Eurasian beavers at the moment. Um, and so I've tried to include a lot of them here, but yeah, they're incredible. Um, and we'll be learning a lot about them in a minute. So I'm gonna basically provide as much detail as I can for these bullet points. So we're gonna go through them and kind of break them down bit by bit to try and see what all the fuss is about with this amazing mammal. So here we go. Oh, let's go next. Okay, the beaver, the Eurasian beaver is the second largest rodent in the world. Now that is after the capybara from South America. And it always um, delight, delights me um, how if I've, uh, I live near the River Otter in Devon, and that's still got the only official wild population of beavers in England at the moment. And I've been very lucky to just be around and about as that trial has kind of been going on and then eventually uh, succeeded um, and has just been inspirational. And whenever I've been down there and seen beavers and been around people who've never seen beavers before, uh, their first reactions are always like, oh my goodness, they are so much bigger than I thought. And they really are. I think a lot of people from photos, it's difficult to get the scale because a lot of people aren't always in uh, sort of providing perspective. Um, a lot of people think that they're quite small, that they're, you know, kind of not guinea pig size, but just not that much bigger. Uh, but they really can get quite large. They can get up to kind of Labrador spaniel size if they need to. 
The head and body length alone of an adult Eurasian beaver can be up to 90 centimetres. And then on top of that, you've got a massive leathery paddle like tail, which can be up to 40 centimetres long. So you're looking at a great big mammal here. And some beavers can easily weigh up to 40 kilograms, and that's about the same as a 12 year old human child. So they're quite hefty. And when Rasheen, my colleague, is trapping and translocating beavers around the country, she's got to be dealing with these great big mammals in the back of her van. So beavers are big and we love them for it. Beavers can live up to eight years old. It kind of give or take, depending on where they are and, and what their history has been. Um, and as you can see in this photo here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, They've got these wonderful, almost hand-like uh, forepaws, and they're much smaller than their, their hind feet. So the hind feet are very big and kind of very flat-footed to help them navigate a very sort of wet, marshy, boggy environment. But these forepaws are so endearingly hand-like, um, and it, they, it helps them manipulate wood and sticks and mud and feed themselves and groom themselves and kind of interact with each other because they're very sociable mammals. Um, I think maybe why I'm so obsessed with beavers is obviously they're a rodent and guinea pigs are rodents. When I was little, I had four guinea pigs at one time and was so overwhelmed by my adoration for this tiny little rodent guinea pig that um, my aspiration was to be a guinea pig breeder for a very long time. Um, it's kind of gone out the window now, but either way, perhaps that's why I love beavers. They're very charismatic and attractive mammals. And it's very special in Britain, I think, to have large furry mammals, uh, you know, in our environment and potentially even near to our doorstep. You know, we haven't got that many of those available to us. Um, many have gone extinct. And so that's why I think there's often the tendency that we look to foreign shores as having the big exciting creatures when actually we're so lucky to have some right here. So, that's the size. Now, you may be wondering why this is another picture by Josh, our community projects officer. I just think that is incredible. Anyway, you may be wondering why I've included a lovely portrait of a female beaver above a vanilla ice cream cone. Here's why. So beavers were native, they still are. And this is why it's such an interesting story because they're conservation and their reintroduction has been difficult and not smooth and yet it seems odd in a way because they should be here and they were here in British landscapes long before humans were so they are incredibly meant to be for a British river but we hunted them to extinction um, and they were extinct for about the last 400 years and we hunted them primarily for their meat and their fur. So British aristocracy at the time considered it a sign of wealth and a symbol of status by having a beaver pelt as part of their maybe winter wardrobe or maybe annual wardrobe, I don't know. But beaver fur is very luxurious. It's very soft and thick and uh, rich. And so that was really highly sought after um, as was their meat. But then also this substance that you may have heard of is called castorium. And it's a special secretion secreted by um, the anal gland. And for beavers in the wild, as part of their evolutionary um, sort of behavior, it's used as communication between family members and also perhaps signals toward other beavers who aren't from the family or the territory off from their patch. So it's will say, oh, hang on, a bit like urine and other mammals, like, no, 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 don't go here. I've already been here, please stay away. So castorium is like scent marking, communication, um, important to beavers, but also humans are like, hey, hang on a sec, this makes great vanilla flavoring um, and also can be a bit of aspirin and also or contribute to medicinal aspirin, um, also can be used in perfume. And so beavers were hunted for their castorium as well. Fun fact, so that's where the vanilla comes in. Apparently, um, <laughs> you can differentiate between a male beaver and a female beaver by the scent of their castorium. How absolutely valid this is, I don't know, but you might find it interesting, it's Friday night, whatever. Male castorium from a beaver, it's meant to be, it's quite, it's actually horrendously sexist, but male castorium is supposedly rumored to smell like engine oil and female castorium is rumored to smell like old cheese. And yet we humans were still like, yeah, that would make great vanilla flavoring for ice cream. And you can still buy it around the world, which is pretty um, sad that you can buy beaver castorium flavored 
vanilla, derived vanilla. Anyway, so that is our journey with beavers up until about 20 years ago. So that's quite interesting and uh, worrying. And yeah, so beavers have been gone from our landscape for about 400 years. And as you probably, it probably won't be a shock to you to realize that our landscape has changed beyond recognition, especially in England during that time. We've got more people, we've got more cars, we've got more roads, we've got less nature. Um, the climate has become increasingly unstable. And so how does the second largest rodent in the world suddenly make a smooth entrance to that stage? Well, it doesn't, and it hasn't. And so you'll find out that it hasn't been a smooth ride, but a fascinating one. So a little bit more about its biology, just to set the scene. This photo is by a wonderful guy called Jason Perry Wilson, Perry Wilson Photography. Oh, let's go back. Uh, this is a river otter beaver. You've got to say that right, because often people think you're talking about these kind of mutant otter beavers. Uh, they are beavers on the river otter. Uh, so this is a kit, I think last year, maybe this year on the river otter. So this is a wild beaver. And it's still so exciting to think that after 400 years, we've now got wild populations of beavers that have been granted permission to stay by the government, um, breeding successfully and giving rise to the next generation of these incredible ecosystem engineers. And it's just really cool to think that. Um, so anyway, I love that photo. It just shows like the chaos of the environment that they live in and kind of the it's very sort of raw and beautiful. I love it. So beavers are crepuscular which is a funny word but that basically means that they are active at dawn and dusk at the beginning and end of the day they are often seen during the day um, and they can move about a bit during the day but the best time to see them usually is at the beginning and end of the day around sunrise sunset and the best time actually to try and watch them is in sort of june july when they've got their, their kits out their babies um, and they're teaching them how to swim so they spend the first sort of six weeks in the lodge um, growing up after they've been born and then they start to venture out and start swimming and practicing nibbling on bits of willow and things um, and it's just a lovely time to see them when the sun's going down and you've got that golden hour this time of year, it's increasingly difficult to see them. Obviously it's getting darker earlier, but also um, they tend to do a lot of building work towards the winter and a lot of maintenance of their structures. So often it's quite hard to just see them kind of chilling out and relaxing as they're being very busy. Um, beavers are also like many mammals, like us, like lions, like elephants, all these sorts of things, dolphins, cetaceans, they're very sociable. And so they really thrive off of the interaction between family members and it's, amazing you know now beavers are, are returning to our landscape um we're learning more and more about these social interactions which perhaps you know that knowledge has been not translated through the centuries so it's really exciting to be learning so much about this animal um, as it's coming back now this is cross-section goals I would love this in my bedroom as a giant poster. This is, um, granted, this is our, the North American beaver. So it's the cousin of the Eurasian beaver, slightly smaller. It's got a bit of a square ahead, different shaped nostrils, but they're very similar. And we often use them as useful uh, case studies in terms of comparing beaver management techniques and beaver biology um, as North America is uh, you know, a lot more ahead in its journey with beavers than, than we are in Britain. Um, so this is an incredible cross section because it shows you basically the life of a beaver. So Eurasian beavers um, obviously have a slightly more crowded uh, on the whole, especially in England, um, area to squeeze into in, um, in terms of the rivers, uh, but that doesn't stop them from doing their work and doing it very well. So as I said, beavers are semi-aquatic, so they're equally happy both above, in, below, swimming in the water, doing whatever. Um, they can hold their breath for quite an impressive amount of time, and they have all sorts of biological adaptations to help them to cope with a life um, that's both under the water, in the water, and out of the water. So the first thing um, that I love seeing when I think I'm lucky enough to see a beaver is their tail is so weird in the water you can see it here it acts like a rudder so it sort of steers them through the current and I've seen a beaver you know going against quite a fast flow and you can literally see them using their tail 
just guiding them through like this, just so that they don't have to expend so much energy plowing through. They're very strong, but you know, their tail acts as a huge source of help there. And then out of the water here, I don't know if you can see that one in the distance, um, its tail acts like a kickstand when it's out. So they're huge cumbersome animals. You can see there's a lot of body there. And so to have this kickstand there to help balance them when they're grooming or using their forepaws or felling a tree or whatever, um, it's very handy. It's very sort of leathery like um, and there's sort of lots of little scales and things. It's a very weird thing, but it works. Um, they've got waterproof fur, waterproof. It's not like Gore-Tex, but it sort of works in a similar way. So under the top layer of fur that we see when we're looking at them, there's another layer that has lots of little hooks or, or barbs that basically traps a layer of air and um, means that they don't get sort of fully soaked when they're, when they're swimming, which is very cool. So here we come to the quintessential Mr. and Mrs. Beaver Lodge that is very Narnia-like actually. And you can immediately see why they build the dam. So the dam is here. And then what the dam does is it just holds the water back and allows that water level to rise so that the entrance to the lodge here is completely submerged. And this is a survival instinct purely evolved to allow the beaver to escape from the wandering eyes of its traditional predators like lynx, wolves, bears, predators that we don't have anymore in the UK, predators that exist in America, but also those predators don't like putting their face under the water. So the beaver, that was the beaver selection pressure that allowed them to evolve the uh, tactic basically of saying, okay, well, how can I, how can I deal with this? How can I deal with a predator that doesn't, uh, that might come in the water, but doesn't want to put its face in? Well, I'm going to submerge the entrance to my lodge and have it super, super secure. So the dam is here. Here's the water level. You can see this beaver is going to go up into the lodge and then it's nice and dry. It's this dry cavern. And studies have shown that um, in the lodge, it can actually be divided into many different rooms and chambers. And um, some of which, this is very personified. Um, there's a room in, in, in some lodges that has been found to almost act like a changing room, like a wet room where they just kind of dry off, they get warm, they settle before they go into the drier. Um, more inland sections of the lodge where they might be raising kits, they might be suckling kits, they might be feeding, sleeping, etc. So there's bedrooms, there's changing rooms, and that is probably so unscientific, but I like thinking of it like that. Um, <laughs> and they build, um, they build their dams not necessarily right next to the lodge, so the dams can be at different parts of the river, but the effect is still the same. So they always, always, always want the lodge to have a submerged entrance to be nice and coy and secretive. And it's very tempting, I think, with the beaver story to believe that the beaver is doing all of its good work, which I'll tell you about in a minute, um, altruistically for wildlife, for the environment, for us, but they're really not, you know, they're, they're, they're lovely creatures, but it, they're really doing all of this as an anti-predator strategy for survival, um, just like, you know, every other animal is just here to survive. So um, that's why it's so interesting that a bonus of its survival strategy just has all these incredible knock-on positive effects. Um, right. Oh, Let's talk about social life for a sec before we go on to that one. So um, beavers, I said, are social mammals, just like us. Um, they suckle dependent young for about one to two years. And then the young will say, oh, I want to leave home. And I'm going to go set up another territory elsewhere, usually in the same catchment. And then we'll start and, and have a family of its own. Um, there's a common misconception, I think, that once beavers have been introduced, that they will just breed and go out of control, that they'll breed like bunnies and there'll be beavers everywhere and they'll reach carrying capacity like that. Um, but to be honest, it's not really the case. As, uh, for example, with the River Otter, um, it's a river that is around a lot of active farmland, a lot of community space, a lot of villages and roads and things. And I think naturally the beaver will never reach its full carrying capacity because there are those other stresses around it that kind of minimize um, it breeding more and more. But also beavers really interestingly, uh, almost I say self-regulate, but they sustain their own carrying capacity. Um, and they are actually very aggressive towards other families that are not in their territory. And they will often or have been known to fight to the death and kill other beavers, other 
conspecific beavers um, when they venture into the territory that's not their own. So, you know, they, they, they will monitor, I guess, movement of the population. Uh, and also they breed annually. They only have one litter per year. So it's not like that, you know, they have several several breeding moments throughout the, the year. They very much have almost a similar, well, they have a long-ish gestation period. So um, beavers will sort of gradually colonize. They don't sort of go bam. Um, so hopefully that answers that pretend question. Uh, right, let's go to this one, their diet. So who knew that beavers were living a plant-based life well before we were? They introduced that whole concept, I believe, or I like to think. Beavers are totally vegan, 100% veg, 100% plant-based. They do not eat fish, Lewis Carroll, or no, C.S. Lewis, forgive me, um, uh, unfortunately led a lot of us down the garden path there. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver do eat fish in line the witch in the wardrobe, but real beavers do not eat fish. No beaver species, American or Eurasian, do not eat fish, which is good, good thing. They actually help fish, but we'll get onto that in a little bit. So um, they have a whole range of things that they like to eat. They eat a pure diet of hardwood, leafy stuff. They like aspen, willow, yew apple, cherry, um, alder, and they literally, as you can see in this one here, they strip the bark off with their massive incisors. And this is a very, very cute baby beaver learning how to chew some willow. I think that might be. Um, and as you can see here, this is a classic, um, it's like an egg timer, beaver shaped stump, and they will be on their way to felling that tree. But what's amazing is that often they can strip the bark um, and, uh, especially on a tree that's sort of more like this and not kill the tree. And you can see coppiced uh, bits of, of new growth coming out little shoots and things, which is just really cool. Cause it's like Chris Jones, who's um, lucky enough to, to work with a lot uh, through Beaver Trust and he owns and runs the Cornwall Beaver Project. He likes to colloquially say that beavers taught us how to manage woodland. And when you go visit a beaver site and a beaver wetland, um, you can't help but you know believe that because it really is something really special. Um, beavers are very strong. They will fell trees that are 10 times the size of them and have absolutely no trouble in dragging that through the river uh, system and taking it back to their dam or their lodge to feed on and play with and build with. It's very, very cool. And to help them do this, they need some pretty hefty teeth. Now, this is probably my favorite fact of beavers and their, their teeth are literally the color, color of a satsuma, tangerine orange. They are bright, bright orange, like a traffic cone. And this is because the enamel is completely impregnated with iron to help facilitate a life spent chewing hardwood. Um, and it's just, I just think it's incredible that they have iron teeth basically. Um, and you can't really see it here, although I was trying to step back earlier and think, oh, can you see it? But basically, <laughs> beaver's lips close behind their teeth. Um, I won't try it. I have tried. It's impossible. And this is so that they can be underwater, so submerged and carry on feeding without ingesting loads of water and effectively drowning. So their lips close behind their teeth. So their teeth are just completely out, which is very cool. Um, and so that is uh, another adaptation to their very quirky lifestyle of a little bit of everything in the river. Next, uh, <laughs> this is my fourth attempt of um, drawing this piece of art. Um, basically, beavers have a third eyelid and it's something kind of a bit gaggy in biology called a nictitating membrane which is very difficult to say. Um, but basically it's a transparent eyelid. So when they go under the water, they shut this transparent eyelid and it's basically allows them to see under the water. And so we like to say, oh, it's like them having goggles, um, which is pretty cool. And uh, this uh, is again, just another excuse to share this adorable photo of a baby beaver. And you can see it's little forepaws really well here. Good claws, good nose. Interestingly, when they're swimming as well, they keep their head above the water when they're traveling. 
and their ears set right on top of their head so that their ears are usually always out of the water and that's so that they can listen out for predators and things like that. And when they're swimming, they, they go like that. You can just see them and they're smelling as they're going, but they kind of bob their head, which is quite cool. They look quite vibey when they're going down a, a still bit of river, smelling with a massive nose. Anyway, so that's fun. Second set of eyelids, uh, third set of eyelids. This is the getting into the juicy bit now. Ecosystem engineer. We did a podcast at Beaver Trust recently with the incredible Dr. Emily Fairfax, who I'm going to mention in a little bit again, who is an eco hydrologist from California, and she is a total beaver expert, total beaver nerd. Her background is in engineering and materials and everything. She's such a smart lady. And she totally admitted complete sort of um, feeling humble as an engineer herself in the presence of a beaver in terms of she says very openly that if she was tasked with building a dam to the skill and level and strength that a beaver does she couldn't do it she says it's impossible and you know when you see a dam it's a completely living structure there's plants growing out of it it's incredibly strong they can last for years decades if they're left alone um you can't help but be mightily impressed so in terms of numbers there are 125 million beavers thereabouts living in 27 countries um, around Europe and they're doing really good work and they're doing it well and they're doing it quite quickly um, so I said that populations of beavers don't necessarily grow as quickly as people worry they will but they do work very quickly um, which is what's really exciting and I've always thought that beavers are an amazing teacher. They teach ecology and they teach us to look at the food web and bottom up conservation, I think more than any other animal. Um, and it's something that I didn't, or I felt now looking back, I feel like I didn't learn so much at school as just ecology and how species interact with each other in an environment to boost its resilience to things like flooding, drought, climate change. And I think beavers present such an exciting opportunity to teach the public about how ecology works. Um, and I really think that that is an exciting and hopeful opportunity. Um, if everyone had a basic understanding of ecology, I think we would solve a lot of the problems that we find ourselves in. Anyway, so beavers and their dams and their ways of working create depth. And create multiple ponds so I showed you that amazing cross-section of the dam and how it raised the water level behind it so they create these network of ponds different depths they create dappled their felling of trees creates dappled light exposes um, areas that haven't seen the sunlight in a while to sunlight um, and create that wonderful dappled effect that we love on a, a sort of quintessential British river brilliant for invertebrates brilliant for amphibians brilliant for birds the food chain starts to build it creates this mosaic of habitats behind the dams. If you go into a beaver wetland, there's a weird sense that you feel like you're walking, an established beaver wetland, you feel like you're walking back in time. You kind of have this weird nostalgic feeling that you've been here before, but obviously you haven't. Um, but there's a feeling that, you know, this is how it should be. And this is why conservationists and ecologists are so excited about the prospect of beavers, because it's a chance to restore um, landscapes that have been lost. And so um, the dams as well are an incredible structure because not only are they a living structure, um, but they offer almost different ways for the water to go. So an established beaver wetland that has where the river has space to kind of flow where it wants to flow. We're so used to canalizing rivers and dredging them and saying, no, you go here, you don't flow that way anymore. You're gonna flow this way because it's better for humans. Rivers are not good at listening to people. They wanna go where they wanna go and they wanna go where the topography leads them. And so Beaver Dam can allow the river to flow around it if there's space for it to do so and create these braided channels. Um, and there's also in these pools, gravel, uh, areas of gravel for riverbeds and all of these environments uh, create brilliant habitat for spawning migratory fish like trout and salmon who can navigate the structure or pot potential hurdle of a beaver dam by going around these braided channels. They can leap over dams, there's footage of fish doing that in Norway um, and areas where beavers are a lot more prevalent. 
and a lot more established. We will go into that in a little bit. Beavers and fish always create a lovely hearty debate, which I'm very happy to engage with. Um, and one of the other things I love with this sort of ecosystem engineer image is Chris Jones, again, um, from the Cornwall Beaver Project, says that beavers whittle our world. And I think that that can be interpreted in so many wonderful ways and um, both literally and figuratively, spiritually. Um, and he has this wonderful analogy where beavers are literally say biodiversity is a bonfire imagine sort of species and species richness and an assemblage of a complex river habitat imagine that as a bonfire beavers are like just chucking petrol on that bonfire and just making it come alive and i think that that is um one of the most wonderful images of how a beaver has an impact um on an environment they are the petrol on the biodiversity bonfire thanks chris jones um okay Deadwood, very briefly, um, there's not enough deadwood around. We have this habit, and we still do, of when a tree falls, we say, oh, that needs to be cleared away. Oh, no, that's a bit messy. Oh, oh keep it tidy, tidy, tidy. But um, trees are meant to have a continued existence on the forest floor. And beavers help make that happen. They fell a tree, and it stays. Um, and often it, there's areas of regrowth. I mentioned how they coppice trees and then there's new shoots and things that spring out, oak saplings, beech saplings, things like that. Um, it's an incredible way of looking at things. Um, and, you know, a woodland is very much on the forest floor as well as up to the sky. Um, and I think that it offers a chance for us to think differently and to, uh, open our minds up as to how things are actually meant to work and how nature wants to work versus how we would like to curate it. Um, Deadwood, of course, is, you can see that it's orange teeth here. They're actually way more orange in real life as well. It's like, whoa, Clementine. Um, the, the Deadwood provided by the work around beaver's habitat is an amazing refuge for all sorts of insects, birds, everything. Um, and again, it's all about building that basis of the food chain to allow other things, top predators, um, to survive and have resilience to climate change and other, th other stresses. Um, I thought this was, um, you might be interested to look at this. This is a before image of the Cornwall Beaver Project in Laddock in Cornwall. Um, before the beavers came, so 2016, this was the existing area of water, this was the river, um, I think it's important to note actually, and I think Glenn sort of alluded to this in terms of river health, um, a, a, a recent ecological study found that no river in England is classed as in good ecological health, every single river in England failed ecological standard testing in terms of quality of water and, and everything, so um, I mean, it's just a no brainer, isn't it? To be thinking, how can we, how can we sort this out? Let's think outside the box. Let's bring the species back. You actually know how to work that environment. Anyway, Cornwall Beaver Project. This is the enclosure. It's about five acres. This is before the beavers came. This is after. This is four years later. So you can see the complexity has massively increased. Um, we've got, and this is, this has changed even more so. I was there two days ago and it's just astonishing what they've done. Whole new wetland, everything, even more so than this. But we've got all these different areas of water here. Um, and the main pond is obviously a lot bigger. It's a lot deeper. Um, and it's just got so more, so much more complex. Oh, um, this area here is just wet. And I remember Chris saying when I was there the other day, when you're looking at it from your eye level, it looks like a dry grassland under your feet it's just wet delicious moist boggy rich habitat and that is so needed um, in English riparian river landscapes um, and as I said beavers can get to work quite quickly and this is just so exciting to see how one species can have so much of an effect for the better. Let's get into how can they help us and our big problems so wildfire um fighting fire with beavers is not a far-fetched concept wildfire incidents in the uk is on the rise um in just looking at some figures here from the european commission um 
In 2018, there were 79 fires larger than 25 hectares, but then in 2019, that figure rose to 137 wildfires. And I'm sure all of you will be able to recall recent wildfires that have happened on our shores in the last year or so, let alone the blazes that have happened this year around the world. Um, this is a real thing. And it's very easy to say, oh, but the UK doesn't suffer from wildfire. That's rubbish, it does. And it will continue to do so. Um, we're suffering from more drought and drought if you ask any farmer, they're most worried about drought and losing water. Um, and so we need to seriously consider this. Um, and, uh, you know, beavers are well known to help mitigate flooding and to slow the peak flow. In Cornwall Beaver Project, they halved the peak flow rate from the headwaters. So that basically meant that instead of taking, this is plucking figures here, but say instead of taking two days for the water to reach from top to bottom, it could take 20 days. So it slows it right down. And I was gonna to talk to you about flooding, but I wanted to talk to you about drought and wildfire instead, because I think that um, that's underdone and I think that it's overlooked and I think we need to look at it more. But feel free to ask me questions about flooding and stuff in the Q&A. So I mentioned there was this amazing lady called Emily Fairfax, who's in California, who studies um, beavers and wildfire and she basically looks at the biggest baddest fires in the states and in California and looks at how well how resilient are beaver wetlands in those events and she produced this astonishing paper last year um, called Smokey the Beaver uh, with her research partner and um, found that beaver wetlands can act as a seriously good fire break against wildfire and you can see these just very simple diagrams showing a stream without beavers and how vulnerable the ground uh, cover is to drought and wildfire and how easily it can ignite versus a stream with beavers so much more water under here I told you how it can look dry but underneath it's very boggy marshy wet moist delicious stream of beavers can be so much more resilient to drought and wildfire. So much so that they included these incredible aerial photographs of a area that had recently uh, had a wildfire. And you can just see this wedge of green here remaining after the wildfire. Everything else is gone, everything's died, everything's ash, except the Beaver River, the Beaver Dam, that there's a dam and the buffer around it is green because the beavers have had space to do what they need to do. And I just think that that is an incredible prospect and we need to take it seriously now because that, is a, that screams climate change mitigation right there. And it's so cost-effective, beavers do it for free. Um, you know, imagine how expensive would it cost a governing body or someone to create a fire break as effective and resilient as that, that also beats biodiversity and also gives us filtered water to drink and everything else. Incredible. Um, also, we must talk about carbon. So again, we defer a lot to research that's done in the States because they're so much more established in their knowledge and journey with beavers, but hopefully give it a few years and the UK will be a repository of that um, same knowledge. Carbon, of course, is something that needs to be um, on every single agenda and everything. And fortunately, beaver wetlands are an immense store of carbon. They literally suck it out of the sky like a giant sponge. And some research by Ellen Wall in the US, um, I'm again just reading from some figures here, compared three different environments in terms of their carbon sequestration. She compared grasslands, which are essentially what oversimplified rivers become. A lot of our rivers that have been so stripped of their natural assets are essentially just grasslands with a bit of water running through it now. Uh, so she compared grasslands with um, inactive beaver wetlands, so relic beaver wetlands, so I guess where beavers had done a bit of work and then moved on, and active beaver wetlands. And she measured how much carbon each of those three habitats soak up. So inactive beaver wetlands were 300 to 400 metric tons of carbon per hectare. Grasslands were 40 to 100 metric tons of carbon per hectare and active beaver meadows were over 1200 to 1400 metric tons of carbon per hectare. Put simply, the difference between the grassland and the active um, meadows 
is about 11 times as much carbon on the low end, but then Ellen had figures that showed that the, I'm putting this in a very roundabout way, basically at the most, the most amount of carbon that an active beaver wetland could soak up was 35 times more than a grassland. So just by allowing the beaver to be there and do its thing, it could potentially at times soak up 35 times as much carbon as a standard grassland bit of river. The data speaks for itself. Um, massive, massive implications for the climate crisis. Um, so because of all this, the beaver is well known as a keystone species. And keystone is a kind of roundabout way of saying that an animal has a disproportionate impact on an environment uh, relative to its size, relative to its numbers. It just is like, whoa, you do a lot and you're not all that much. It's quite like a sort of the humble beaver is um, well understood. And for sort of wildlifey, planty reasons, this is really, really exciting. So um, migratory fish, I sort of briefly glossed over uh, that sort of stuff. This is Chris Jones, Cornwall Beaver Project. And this is a fish, a trout, and he has found, oh, let's go back there. Uh, Chris has observed countless times how trout and salmon use his wetlands as an area of refuge. Um, it's like a pause, it's like a service station, I guess, um, on their way to migrate to other parts of the river to spawn. Um, and, you know, of course, salmon and trout and beavers co-evolved and coexisted together for millennia, way before humans came on the scene. And there are some people who go as far to say that beavers taught salmon to leap by giving them the dance. Selma Sailor, the Latin for salmon is leaper. Um, and I don't know, you know, how scientific um, that, that thought is, but it's certainly incredibly provoking. And uh, when you think dams are, are a barrier, um, they hold back an, an immense amount of water. But in England, every one and a half kilometers on a river, there's a man-made culvert and that's a barrier too. Um, but that's one that we've put in there that serves no biological purpose. So food for thought. Um, Chris has also noticed that the trout and the trout especially have doubled in size and weight since the beavers being there, they're just healthier fish, happier fish. Uh, plants really underdone, but plants really love a beaver wetland. This is an orchid on a beaver wetland. I can't tell you what kind of orchid it is, but it's a pretty one. Um, there's quite a cool study, very elegant data actually, um, from the University of Stirling. Um, it's 12 year long, so a really long term data set, um, looking at the beavers on Tay side, and they found that plant species richness rose by nearly 50% over that 12 year period and the number of species recorded more than doubled and they also found that the surrounding vegetation around the river increased in complexity by 71 percent over those 12 years and with that of course comes all sorts of insects i know chris has got at least 12 species of um uh, Odonata, so damsel, damselfly and dragonfly down at the cornwall beaver project that tiny little five acre site it's incredible and also what's really cool is in those standing areas of water behind a dam, um, you can, it encourages the formation of lots and lots of algae, um, which is so easy to just completely overlook. The algae, of course, is the absolute base of the food chain. And so where there is algae, that is the foundation for all sorts of other things um, to grow and flourish and um, yeah, hang out on the, on, on the wetland. Um, so that's really exciting. But how do we manage beavers? This is always the crux. This is always the question that people want to answer and ask. Uh, <laughs> um, beavers present change. And I don't know about you, but I hate change. I really do. I don't deal well with it. I, I like things to be the same. I like predict, to be able to predict things. Um, I don't like unease. Makes me anxious. So beavers do present change and it's only natural. They haven't been here for 400 years. We've got used to the way things are, how we like to do things, how we like to dictate where a river goes. All of a sudden, huge rodent is like, mm -mm, this isn't how we do it. I'm gonna do it this way. And uh, 
uh, present a few problems. Beavers do make themselves known very quickly and very overtly in an environment and they can be a pain. And we're very happy to admit that beavers can be an absolute pain. However, we are very lucky that there are some tried and tested, simple, cheap and effective techniques to help us coexist successfully alongside them. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about them um, to help promote uh, conflict resolution. This wonderful lady here is Dr. Rasheen Campbell Palmer. We're very lucky to have her on the team at Beaver Trust as restoration manager. And she is basically responsible for the movement of beavers all over Britain. Um, she traps and translocates them incredibly humanely. Um, she health screens them. It's really important to make sure that we've got healthy beavers going into a new environment. That they are healthy and they're not going to transmit any infectious diseases to any uh, wildlife or other mammals in the area. She also is really um, an important part of making sure that we're uh, varying the genetics of the beaver population that's coming back to British rivers. So um, we want to prevent as inbreeding, which can cause all sorts of problems um, and make sure that we get beavers from lots of different places to make sure the gene pool is really large and nice and healthy. So Rasheen is an absolutely pivotal, possibly the most expert person in Europe at the moment doing this sort of thing on a day to day basis. Um, so trapping and translocation is one of the most effective ways of removing beavers from a site where they're not welcome or they're not, um, they're, they're more of a, a hassle than a help. And so um, that's always the method that we want to go to. Lethal control uh, can happen, will happen, is going to, we've got to accept that, but we'd always promote trapping and translocation first and foremost and all the other techniques I'm going to go through, um, lethal control as a last resort. Trees, people get precious about trees, and of course it's easy to understand why. Fortunately, um, beavers can be deterred from their nibbling uh, with things like tree guards, and also there's this cool paste, which is literally just sand and glue. You paint it onto the base of trees and then it dries clear, so it doesn't ruin the aesthetic of a nice line of trees, and it completely deters the beaver from having a nibble, so they do not want to do that. So really cheap, cost-effective ways that landowners can implement um, uh, to, to manage a growing population of beavers. Um, you can also remove, you can also uh, lessen the height of a dam. So if a dam is quite large, some of them can get absolutely massive and it can flood nearby roads or wetlands. You can just take a bit of height off that dam to lower the water. Um, there are some quite funny stories from colleagues at Devon Wildlife Trust who have been playing dam tennis. Uh, I came up with that phrase, it's not very good. Um, with beavers so they remove a bit of the dam the beavers are like no I like it like that and they build it back up and then Devon Wildlife Trust remove it so in that instance the beavers could be translocated or the dam could just be removed altogether and then the beavers can just quite happily find somewhere else to dam so lots of different things to keep people busy this is Rob Needham he works for Beaver Trust as well with Roisin as restoration coordinator and here he's installing a flow device which basically beavers if they find a leak in the dam they want to plug it straight away um, they hear the rushing sound of the water and they think oh I need to fix that like good engineers um, but if there's a dam that's causing a problem and perhaps flooding a nearby bit of road or land um, you can install a flow device to basically deter the beaver from maintaining that dam by uh, almost silencing the flow of that water and it's kind of down there so they can't hear it so that's quite cool and you might see lots of these about in dams and rivers near you in the future. Um, so the other thing that I think is really important in conservation in any restoration conservation project is just collaboration and talking and listening and sharing views and making sure people who are concerned feel that their concerns are valid and that they're heard and acted upon. Um, and so uh, it's really great to be doing this talk and talking to you guys about this um, and to keep this dialogue open and going. And then also Chris and the people at Beaver Trust and of course the wonderful Wildlife Trust hosting all sorts of public engagement events to just give people the space and opportunity to learn about these fantastic creatures, um, ask questions and to feel listened to if they're worried about anything and so having that people interaction and showing that conservation is such a people project as well as an animal wildlife nature project um, is really really important. Uh, the status of beavers is pending. <laughs> um, you may have heard a few weeks ago the announcement of a public consultation by DEFRA about beavers. 
um, where they're giving the public three months to have their say in their reintroduction. And then hopefully the decision will be that their status is officially protected and they will be officially native again as of next year is so far um, what we know. Um, but there is an opportunity to really have your say. Um, and we've got until I think mid-November to do that. So that's really cool. So that's an opportunity to share your voice and your thoughts. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought I'd finish with this tweet again by Chris, um, who I think summarizes um, this all really. So he says, four years ago today, beavers were released at Woodland Valley. Since then, they have built eight dams, turned one stream into four, cut peak flow by half, produced habitat galore, seen trout increase in size eightfold, Posted eight new birds and a whole bunch of other stuff. Get on with it, Defra. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that's it. There's that cute beaver again. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was absolutely amazing. Um, just gripped. Um, I'm a bit speechless, which doesn't often happen. Um, so <laughs> I will. Um, I will go to the first question, um, and from um, an anonymous attendee, um, mm -hmm. if they haven't been, if they haven't been around for four hundred years, where are they being reintroduced from? Very, very good question. Thank you very much for that. Great question. Yes. So um, I mentioned um, that we're trying to ensure that the genetic health of all the, the beavers that are coming back is really good. So they've got a nice big varied gene pool so that breeding success is going to be a long term thing. And so we've had beavers from Scotland and there's a big, there's a big supply of beavers from Scotland, Bavaria, parts of Germany. Um, so a mixture of Europe and then Scotland and then obviously other parts of England. But I think the way that we hope it will work is as there are more and more beavers that they'll, um, you know, beavers will be sort of moving about the place. Um, and then currently in enclosures as kits uh, reach their age of, of one to two before they want to start naturally dispersing, they'll be translocated to a new site. So those beavers will then be moved far away so that their genes can, can work well. Um, in other parts of the country. So at the moment, we're getting them mainly from Scotland and Bavaria, but I imagine it will be more a sort of nationwide thing. Brilliant. Glenn, are you asking a question? Yeah, sorry, apologies about that. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we've got a question from Lizzie. Um, how long do beavers live for? Um, so they live for about seven to eight years on the whole, give or take. Um, but still, we're in a kind of fortunate position of finding all this information out and forming trends and data sets as they start to come back. So that could change. But and around about that, seven to eight. Is that in the wild or is that in captivity? Um, I think it varies. I think um, in the in enclosures, they've been more... Uh, lasting around the seven to eight mark um not too sure about the wild i guess we'll find out as they get more wild brilliant um okay i'll ask the next question um glenn and i are doing a a, a pincer action tonight um a fab presentation uh, this is from alex um is there much evidence to suggest that beaver pre presence on a river has a positive impact on river pollution levels or on the flip side whether a river with too much pollution would negatively impact the beavers brilliant question alex thank you very much for asking that yeah gosh that is a really good question so to answer the first half of it um there's absolutely data to show that that beavers can improve river water quality so one of the amazing other things about a dam is that it it's been seen to almost act like a giant filter um, and the water flowing into a dam comes out cleaner the other side and again that's what attracts so many invertebrates and fish species and birds and things because that water is almost like going through a purifying filter through the dam um, and there's been I've anecdotally seen on the river Otter for example in areas of when the river's been in spate after a storm um, there's a network of dams that that's kind of up say this part of the river and then there's like a, a 
little man-made culvert canal thing that feeds that that lovely uh, filtered water into the main part of the river and where that clean water feeds into the main part of the river um, there was a complete color difference so it had just been really rainy and this water that was flowing in from the series of dams upstream was clear and the main part of the river was brown and this clear water was mixing with the brown and it was just so, so defined this line and I couldn't um, help but think that that was because it had flowed through several beaver dams to get there. And then studies have shown, for example, the River Otter Beaver Trial, the Science and Evidence Report produced by X University in conjunction with them. I'd really give that a read because that really um, yeah, brilliantly demonstrates and shows the data that they collected there. And in terms of whether a polluted river could harm the beavers, um, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of things that we still don't know. But we, I think, like to hope that the beavers are, you know, they're robust, resilient mammals. Um, and I think that they would, would, could quickly and can quickly turn a river around and restore it and breathe life back into it. Um, so I think that there's no river that they couldn't tackle and give a good go. Brilliant. Wow. That must have been something to see. Incredible. Yeah. Okay. Um, Next question. It's my turn. Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting over excited. <laughs> uh, this one's from Donald, and it's uh, what are the barriers to a quicker reintroduction of beavers onto the UK river network? Is it landowners, government, i.e. DEFRA, or the general public? Good question. Um, it's definitely not the general public, uh, that's for sure. General public seem way too excited about beavers which is obviously great. Um, but the, the, the people who are concerned generally and are providing the, um, the, and making this take time is, and it's all for good reason, um, are people who genuinely and quite rightly feel concerned that beavers are going to damage their land, damage the area around their land. So landowners, it's very easy for someone like me who's got the tiniest garden ever to say beavers are great, beavers are great, let's all get loads of beavers. Um, but then of course, when you've got farmer Jones down the road, um, whose livelihood is on the land and a beaver could quite easily destroy a, a field of crops, that's a huge amount of money, um, then you know that's a different story. And we have to listen to these people. And I think traditionally, um, these people don't feel too listened to. So landowners and, and anglers and people who, who have become accustomed to the land and rivers working in a certain way um, are wanting to be spoken to and listened to. And then also policy, uh, policy in this country takes a while to sort out. So that is um, what is uh, taking some time. But the good thing is, is that, you know, DEFRA and the, and the government are open to conversation and we're having conversations with them and they're going well. Um, and so the fact that the beaver is hopefully going to be recognised as native as of next year is going to be an amazing thing, hopefully, for their future. So it's a mixture of all sorts of things. Um, but the fact that, you know, we're having these conversations and we're seeing these, um, you know, more and more organisations and sites are welcoming beavers is a really, really positive thing, considering where we were three, four, five years ago. Brilliant. Brilliant. We've got a couple more questions. So if um, anyone would, would like to ask a question, Please do get in there uh, before Glenn uh, asks his own questions, because I know it will take up a lot of time. <laughs> uh, right, we've got a question from Penny. How many beaver project sites are there around the, the country? Good question. I'm going to put my hands up and say, honestly, I can't keep track. I have a feeling, I mean, feel free to chip in here, Sophie or Glenn, but is it around about like the 20 mark? Um, there's all sorts. Obviously, there's official ones and slightly unofficial, but we will gloss over that very quickly. Um, <laughs> but it's going really well, basically, and the Wildlife Trust have mass are massively pioneering um, the the majority of those of those projects, which is really exciting. And they're around all sorts of habitats. Um, there's ones. Is there one on the Isle of Wight? I think. Um, or something and then there's some in, in the city centre of London which is really cool and in Plymouth and things so yeah there's all sorts going on um new projects popping up and the great thing as well is that with my beaver trust hat on we're getting a lot of um 
of interest from uh, private landowners and people who say, hey, I've been living on a farm for 50 years. I've got this area, I've got this stream in a wooded valley in Wales or somewhere um, kind of interested in beavers, didn't realize they could perhaps come onto my land and I could apply for a license. So I think a mixture of having these official and then, um, you know, sort of private reintroductions of, of beavers is hopefully going to help them get out there. Brilliant. Okay, um... Oh, I should say, actually, that there is a map on Beaver Trust's website that um, shows where the current projects are and where the current populations are. And I think there's a similar one on the Wildlife Trust as well, or somewhere, but these maps do exist, and I think they possibly need updating by the month now. Um, so, yeah, work in progress. Cool. And um, we've got a question here from Lizzie. And is land ownership an issue with reintroduction? Uh, yes. In, in what sense do you, exactly? Owning land yeah. yourself or? I guess you may have answered that with the, the, um, the, the farmer question. I don't know if you want to add to that, Lizzie, um, with the, yeah, sort of affecting, you know, farming livelihoods, for example, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, well, that one. yeah, um, so. Potentially it, up and downstream of release sites as well, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. In terms of, there's different ways you can look at it. If you mean, is it an issue in terms of um, hindering a beaver reintroduction or is it an issue in terms of receiving impact, unwanted impacts of beaver reintroduction? If it's the latter, then all of those techniques that I mentioned towards the end of my presentation about mitigating um, and promoting coexistence of beavers um, are hopefully going to just become normalized as part of um, farming practice. And there are schemes that, that are being um, very diligently worked towards to help reward farmers um, with payment schemes and things to help incentivize working alongside with beavers. So um, there are lots of things for farmers and landowners to be worried about, but then there are also organizations like the Wildlife Trust who are working really, really hard to make sure that um, beaver reintroduction benefits everyone and they become, uh, beavers are a friend to farmers and not a foe. Brilliant. Um, we've just got another question that's come in from Alex. Um, on, the, on the subject of beaver conflicts, are there any financial subsidies, uh, mitigations in place for landowners who may lose profitable land? Um, I'm not aware of ones that are beaver specific. I think we're still too early in our journey with beavers to have that. So it's something that um, is being worked on for sure. And as I alluded to a minute ago, um, there are schemes in place that are going to be launching very, very soon to financially reward farmers for leaving space on their rivers, um, leaving kind of like buffer zones alongside their rivers um, so that any, which includes absorbing a lot of the impacts that beavers will have so they're not felt on the land itself. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions as well, sure. Sophie. Um, so, yeah, obviously we've got the beaver consultation, uh, which is, runs till November. Um, so following that consultation, um, when is there likely to be a decision on that? And what will that mean in terms of beaver releases going forward? Will that mean that they will be, un they will be able to be unfenced releases following the outcome of that if it's successful? Um, I'm not sure when the announcement's going to happen. So far, the government haven't uh, kept a schedule on announcements for various things. Um, but the, the consultation ends in November, as you said. But I'm not sure when a decision will be made, probably early next year, I imagine. Um, in terms of what it will mean if it's successful, uh, they'll still need, you'll still need licenses to have beavers on your land, but they will be as far as I know, um, unfenced. But don't quote me on that. It's very complicated and it's not um, my department. But as far as I know, you'll still need a license. Um, but in terms of a what the future will look like, um, I think all of the conservation organisations who are involved in beaver reintroduction hope that beavers will just become a normalised part of our river 
um, and that there'll be job opportunities created for people to be almost beaver officers to help manage these impacts, work really closely with farmers, make sure the farmers feel comfortable. Um, and also education is a massive thing, you know, help teach people about, um, you know, what beavers do and how wrapping a tree can really help or how painting a tree can really help and how to remove a dam and how to trap and translocate a beaver and all these sorts of things and how to talk to the right people. Um, and also I think a, a big thing would be to educate future farmers and future landowners and agricultural colleges and things and just make beavers part of the curriculum and part of the agenda and not so much it's very tempting to glamorize them all the time in comms and to have fun with their charisma and all of this but at the end of the day we just want them to be part of the river um, and so uh, it would be great to have a future where um, beaver instruction is just one part of river restoration then we can start to zoom out and look at landscape scale stuff and wetland things yeah i mean just uh just a comment on that point i think i love your i love what you said earlier about um we kind of all need a bit of a uh, an ecological education really in, in mm. about you know how we go about problem solving and i'm fully aware you know i've been a fake beaver for the last sort of eight years doing bits and bobs and <laughs> when i look at what a beaver can do in probably three weeks it can probably do more than what I can do you know mm. in, a, in a whole year um and it, you know it's very for people in our sector it's, in, it's incredibly exciting our, our rivers are, have obviously been to hell and back uh, mm. really in the, in, the, in the last 80 or so years um but I'm also aware that I am looking at it from that ecological perspective and mm. um you know there's there's uh, there's the anglers as well who are um, you know, they, they, they are concerned and they have their own arguments, etc. I think there's really good arguments for, as, as you've sort of suggested, um, as to how great they can be for fish populations, for fish mm -hmm. nursery sites, etc., for keeping those base flows going. So when some of our, you know, our headwaters are starting to dry up, if, we, if we've got beaver dams up there. Mm. But really, you know, we, we like to work very closely with with um anglers and we do um and it, you know so any any kind of uh, tips or any any work that you've done with anglers in the past you know to sort of convince them that it is actually a good idea you know we'd obviously always be um very mm. glad of glad of any advice on that well there's some fantastic studies um from norway that came out earlier this year showing how um you know carrying capacity of um, salmon in beaver streams versus non beaver streams and it's just you just can't ignore it it's just incredible and it just is another reminder that these animals were, were evolving together way before we came onto the scene as I said before <laughs> but um, I think with anglers it's it's a really interesting stakeholder group to work with because they really know the river and I think that you know we, we must really respect that knowledge um, and they've got such time and energy and patience on the river that is unmatched in a way unless you're like a, a field officer um working on the river and things um so we really need to listen to them and i think in working um you know colleagues who have worked with anglers it's just making the time to have that open discussion and to just listen to what they have to say and then nine times out of ten they come back and they're more receptive to listening to those data sets and hearing about those papers and stuff. Whereas if you go about the other way and bombard them with data, then you're just gonna switch them off. No one wants to hear numbers. But I think if people feel listened to you first um, and then feel that their concerns are valid. Um, and then I think just seeing examples of where it's worked and hearing that there are so many anglers who really champion beavers. And I think they're really important people to bring into this discussion um, so that, you know, other anglers who are a bit concerned or, or on the fence can can look at these anglers who have come full circle um, and say, oh, OK, well, if you're OK with it, then, then maybe I will be. Um, but and I think in yeah. years to come, as, as, as you've uh, mentioned, is the um, the data we'll be getting from a lot of these sites on, you know, in terms of fish stocks, uh, mm. it's only going to help uh, yeah. in that, isn't it? So massively. Yeah. Sophie, would you? like to do the honours for the last yes question. that would be wonderful and um please ask as many questions as you like we've um 
uh, please don't feel guilty for asking multiple questions. Uh, we're happy to answer them. Um, so last question, go on. We can we'll squeeze more, one more out, Alex, come on. Uh, what can members of the public do to help beavers along with their um, reintroduction to, re, sorry, reintroduction journey? Great question. Really good question. I think the fact that you're here this evening on your Friday night is a great step. Um, I think engaging with uh, the reintroductions that are being promoted across social media, um, like uh, that lots of the wildlife trusts are and things like that, I think is really good. Sharing them with your friends, family. Um, I think also uh, sharing your voice in the public consultation is a really important thing because you know you can be part of that outcome um and it's it's a it's a one chance really to do that we're not going to get another public consultation so that's a really cool cool part to be involved in in a policy decision there um and yeah i think just just supporting the whole beaver movement and um reading up about it i mean there's just endless fascination and things to learn about this animal and its biology and i've never it's amazing when you're on a river watching beavers, there is not one person who is not completely enthralled watching them. Um, whether they were, whether they cared about it before they saw that moment, don't know, but in that moment, they're like, okay, I get it. So I think just um, enjoying this very rare, unique conservation story and trying to be part of it by sharing it and sharing your voice, I think is probably just the main thing. How oh, wonderful. Glenn, I, think, I feel um, the need for a site visit. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, another comment is, of course, here in Surrey, we're one of the worst affected by wildfires because we do have such mm. um, large areas of heathland and, you know, we, we, we've been seeing them getting worse over recent years mm. uh, to the detriment, obviously, of our, a lot of our ground nesting birds who are nesting mm. at that, the, those times of year. Um, at the same time, we have another problem, and that is that a lot of our heathlands, um, the wet areas on them, which we call mire habitat, which is incredibly rare, uh, have been drained long ago. Um, mm. And beavers could actually kill two bears with one stone here if we were able to um, get them on site to not only do, as Sophie's talk showed with the fire breaks, but also to restore that mire habitat as well. Mm. Um, so that is certainly something uh, the Wildlife Trust would be looking into. But yeah, firefighting beavers in Surrey, I mean, it's probably, we're one of the best counties um, to, to have that in our toolkit, really. So it's certainly something um, mm. to keep our eyes open about. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And in, in terms of like, um, drought as well. Uh, again, Chris Jones um, has an incredible anecdote of the drought in May 2020, so just after the pandemic kicked off. He was the only farmer in the valley who had water to uh, water his crops, and that was because he was able to siphon water from the beaver pond onto his fields. Um, and he hadn't been in that position before the beavers. And so in terms of an incredible store of fresh, good quality water, it's a no-brainer. Brilliant. Fabulous. Well, there's no more questions coming in. Glenn, do you have any more questions? No, I'm sure we could probably go on chatting for hours, but <laughs> Sophie's a very busy lady and I know you've got lots of work to do and more presentations next week. Um, so I will just thank you so much for your time and your inspiring talk tonight. Um, it's been it's entertaining and just full of incredible information. Um, you're a born presenter, absolutely brilliant. Thank uh, you so much. Too kind. No, that's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, all the best with Surrey and its beavers. So exciting. Yep, absolutely. Um, that'll be next year's River Week, Rivers Week talk. Um, uh, oh, Penny's just said, uh, thank you for an amazing talk. Um, oh, and another comment, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, that's Welcome. from Norma. Um, so Thanks for coming, I, everyone. Yeah, this brings <laughs> us to an end of Rivers Week, which is quite sad, really. Um, it's been a whirlwind of a week with lots of different presentations and Sophie's pre uh, presentation will be available on YouTube as well. Um, so if you do have, as she said, 
encourage your friends and family uh, to watch this such important messages on how beavers can really transform our landscape for our benefit as well as well as wildlife um, which is hugely important um, and combating climate change just incredible um, so uh, share this video um, far and wide um, tell your friends about it and um, thank you so much for your support and uh, hopefully see you at future events run by Surrey Wildlife Trust. Um, so um, have a great evening, everybody, and see you soon.